The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, January 2nd, 2017. Wow. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. Whoa, it's 2017. Can't believe it. Oh, my, I'm so hungover from going to bed at like 930 on New Year's Eve and just like having probably pasta with Mila and Saul. And then I'm not hungover. I'm just New Year sucked. I'm not going to have kids. Michael's hungover. Yes. New Year's was fine. Maybe I watched the ball. I probably taped it. <laughs> watched it the next day. <laughs> but I saw the parades with the kids on okay, TV, and they good. probably liked that. I wonder what Matt was doing. God, it's 2017 sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Matt was playing PlayStation. But here is the good news. We're going to be back. Duty. We're going to be back tomorrow live, ladies and gentlemen. But we had one more best of 2016. And uh, this one was also sort of thematic uh, for what we're going to be facing in 2017. Wasn't it Michael who did this interview? It was. It was It was a really an honor, actually, because it was with Ronnie Casseroles, who in the early 1960s, along with Nelson Mandela and others, actually found and helped found the armed wing of the African National Congress. He was a Jewish South African communist. And then he went on to serve as a minister under Nelson Mandela. Then he was the intelligence minister under Thabo Mbeki. He was the successor to Nelson Mandela. And now he's an activist again against the current president of South Africa and for Palestinian human rights. So he's a guy that I've always really admired and is pretty fascinating. And the interview we did was about an operation that he uh, headed in the early, in the uh, 60s called the London Recruits, where European and American white young people basically would go into South Africa. They would pose as tourists. And the purpose of what they were doing there was to basically smuggle in, smuggle in things like pamphlets and all sorts of other things to basically let the population know that the ANC uh, still existed and was still plotting to dismantle apartheid because that was a time of like incredible repression. And even some of the tactics they used, like they would set up uh, loudspeakers with cassette tapes on tops of buildings I, and then they would have, yeah, I mean, there's, I'm give, it's a hint, plenty no. of other things, plenty of stories. You don't want to give it away. It's, I'm not giving away the whole story, believe me. Did you do, and this is what everybody wants to know, did you do... Your Nelson Mandela, your right wing Nelson Mandela. It was so surprising because at the end I said, Mr. Costrels, I want to thank you for all of your service and everything you've done. And by the way, I do this incredibly tasteless impression of a person that you probably revere more than anybody else in the world. And uh, and he and then and I did it, and he turned it back on me and he said, "This is bullshit. <laughs> I have been fighting the liberal homosexual agenda for decades." Uh, no, Ronnie Kestrels, it turns out, does not have a version of right-wing Mandela, and I did not do the impression. I'm saving that well, for That would have been, I mean... That would have been groundbreaking. That would have been, it could have been really disturbing if it turned out that you had basically stolen his impression. Yeah, he, he, there was actually a legal, a legal complaint well, lodged I mean, in just, Cape Town. Also, people would have been like, oh, God, then maybe that's why you didn't do it. No, I maybe, didn't. Yeah, maybe Michael did secretly steal that from Ronnie Castro. Yeah, in and addition to serving as a minister for Mandela and Becky, and he was also the originator of right wing. It's sort of hard to believe that he wouldn't have an impression of him. Oh, I'm sure everybody has an impression of him. All right, but that's neither here nor there. The value of the interview is not is not in the hypothetical of the impression. But I will. I promise the next time I interview a prominent South African freedom fighter, I'll be sure to do the right wing Mandela impression. I love it. All right, and uh, and of course, um, Matt will sprinkle in uh, maybe a YouTube thing in a jig, and then what? What is that? Wow, mean? why do we keep giving them so much? Maybe that's too much. I mean, yes, people love to go to jointhemajorityreport dot com because of all the extra material they get. But how much extra material can people actually ingest? Please stop it. All right, folks, we will be back live tomorrow, uh, and we will see you then.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now, and it's really an honor uh, to be having him on, is Ronnie Casseroles. He was a member of the African National Congress's military wing from, 19, from 1960 at the age of 21, um, and uh, a leader in the movement in the armed uh, struggle for the African National Congress. He was a deputy uh, minister of defense under the government of Nelson Mandela. In 1999, he became water minister and, and was the minister for the intelligence services under the presidency of Thabo Mbeki, who was the second president of a democratic South Africa. Ronnie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good day. So w let's start the conversation. You're involved with a new uh, film project called London Recruits, uh, which documents the work that you did in the UK um, with a number of British students in the 1960s uh, to sort of essentially keep the presence of the ANC alive in South Africa. Could you explain the context of where the ANC was, where the armed struggle was against the apartheid at that point, and what led you to London to work with these London recruits? Sure, but if you don't mind, mm -hmm. you said British uh, activists. Mm -hmm. They were recruited in London, Britain, mm -hmm. um, by myself, amongst other people, from mm -hmm. the ANC. But I want to quickly add that we recruited people from many countries, including your own Danny Schechter from New York, who unfortunately died yeah. um, sometime last year. I met him at the London School of Economics, and he was one of the volunteers. We had um, young people, workers, trade unionists. He was a student at the LSC. Mm -hmm. And amongst them were Scots and Irish and Londoners and... Welsh people, British people, uh, French and Greek and Dutch and Canadians and so on. But to get to your question about the context um, and what brought me to London and involvement in recruiting uh, young activists uh, to go to South Africa and uh, smuggle in literature, material, leaflets and get them distributed in some exciting ways. Um, one has to recall the early part of 1960, that decade, you know, the world came to really know uh, South Africa uh, as a result of the Sharpeville massacre that killed 68 people in cold blood and wounded 200 others. Uh, African people, black people who'd been protesting against the infamous pass identity laws. Um, and Nelson Mandela and other leaders go underground, a struggle that had basically been along non-violent but very active um, lines was a struggle that now embraced um, sabotage action on, on, on the way to the utilization of armed struggle. I was one of those involved, and uh, with a crackdown that came with Mandela's arrest and the arrest of leaders in the Rivonia raid and trial, Susulu and Becky Goldberg with Mandela and uh, a number of others sentenced to life imprisonment, there was this almighty crackdown on the ANC liberation movement, South African Communist Party, and uh, the movement was all but crushed. It certainly didn't have any ability to produce a leaflet and get it distributed. People were lying low, those who weren't in exile or in the prisons. Um, well, I was fortunate to escape arrest and worked in Tanzania under the leadership of Oliver Tambo for a couple of years. By 1966, he sent me to London to join with the other leaders there. I was a youngster, I wasn't a leader, but to join with Joe Slovo, uh, Dr. Yusuf Dadu, um, and they were a South African group there that was attempting to revive the underground within South Africa. London, okay, seven, 8,000 miles away, far 
further away from South Africa than Tanzania, where we had our headquarters. But um, the lines of communication, shipping, airlines, uh, this was very active, and Britain, the um, major trading partner, students from South Africa flocked to Britain, as did business people and tourists. So we hit on the idea of um, recruiting young, they, some were older, white people, they had to be fair-skinned. Um, so as not to arouse suspicious, to move freely in this apartheid race-minded state, to send them in, uh, uh, some through ships, through the the, the cruise ships, um, mail boats as they were called in those days, in the majority by air, as tourists, and they were welcomed. And uh, as long as they didn't draw attention to themselves. They could move around uh, beyond suspicion. But in those days, <laughs> unlike traveling today, you know, you could jump on a plane, uh, you could stash anything in your suitcases. They weren't even searched. We, we, we built suitcases with false bottoms, in the bottom of which we had leaflets, and we trained these people up. Um, to distribute this material in quite imaginative ways, which we can come to. But the key thing was that the whole effort was to break through the silence uh, of a police state and get messages through to the masses of South Africans uh, particularly the African, the black people, and the mixed race people uh, who suffered so much uh, and under apartheid, to get the simple message across to them that the liberation movement was alive, that the ANC was alive, that, um, that uh, there was hope that we would win in the end, that they should never give up hope. So it was the inspirational messages that were required um, to break, as I say, the silence of the, re- of the repression. That's really... And that's what yeah. led to this whole project. You know, I, one question that actually occurs to me as you describe this, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that, you know, the people that you recruited to do this are, first of all, they're very physically, you know, brave people. These are courageous people, very committed to their ideals, and they have leftist ideals, non-racial ideals, they're playing the role of tourists and presumably, and obviously tourists who are comfortable, either I would assume either sort of entirely apolitical to the extent anyone actually is apolitical or maybe even supportive of the apartheid system to the extent it comes up in conversation. But then at the same time, you're recruiting kind of the most radical and the most also just, you know, rule breaking. So... As they went to South Africa, like, were there uh, times where just through sort of being themselves, they maybe did arouse some suspicion, or were they like serious cadres and no problem? Yeah, well, look, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, First of all, they were young uh, in the main. There were some older people who were maybe in their 30s. But in the main, these were young people very active in their trade unions. These were the the British guys um, in the anti-apartheid movement, in the uh, protests against the American war in Vietnam, in the CND campaign for nuclear disarmament movement. And quite frankly, some of them were just 19, 20, amongst them students. And amongst them was a wonderful student from Brooklyn, from the Bronx, uh, New York, uh, Danny Schechter. Right. Now, they, they were disciplined, they were serious, but they, they loved life, they, they were fun to be with, and Danny was the quintessence of that. So you put a guy like Danny into South Africa to behave like a tourist, not to draw attention to himself, as they were all... All, all, all told, and um, it's quite hard to do these things with irrepressible young people, and Danny's one of them. So 
he uh, goes into a fairly cheap type hotel. Uh, we didn't have money to put them in any any star hotels. And uh, it's a hotel, therefore, that doesn't have any ensuite bathroom. It's got a, a, a bathroom facility uh, for people on that particular floor. And he ambles down the passage to run a bath, goes back to his room, where he's got his suitcase stashed with these uh, <laughs> these these leaflets, and he forgets that he's running a bath, and there's all sorts of commotion, and they come to the door, and you left the tap on, and so on, and this water is down the passage, etc. So of course he apologises, and the the manager understands, the white manager, and disappears because he's got his boys, in quotes, doing the job of mopping out. Right. The boys are elderly African cleaners uh, who are down on their hands and knees mopping up the water. Our, our lad from the Bronx, without thinking twice, rolls up his trousers, gets down on the floor with the guys, and he starts mopping up as well. They are absolutely amazed. Right. There's this white man who's doing this job, you see. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, there was no white person around to see it. They would have just wondered what gives with this character. When Danny gets back to London and tells me about it, God, you know, I just can't believe it. And of course, I, I, my heart skips a beat, but then I'm laughing because he got away with it. But sure, this question of yours strikes to the humanity because that, that, that really was an expression of the humanity of Danny Schechter, of the humanity of these young Communist League um, activists who were many who, who volunteered, trade unionists, working class background, and others um, from, the, from the universities um, who weren't in any particular party as such but non-aligned, but leftist and, and, and anti-apartheid. And, you know, I could regale you with some of the, the stories of these young British guys who get involved in some of the things. I mean, if there's time, I'll give you one G give me, story. Give us another funny story. Give us or, or Okay, yeah, there's, there, there, there's two, two brothers, um, the Bell brothers, B-E-L-L. -L. I call them the Bell boys to this day. They're well into their 70s. And um, this is Ron and Tom. They <laughs> crack jokes, they, you know, 10 to, to, the, to the minute. Um, they're very dedicated in the British Young Communist League, very active in the anti-apartheid movement and in their trade union. And they've never been on a plane. They've never been outside Britain. So that's a huge adventure in itself. Uh, we put them into a similar hotel to Danny's in Cape Town. And um, they go about their task. The first part is reconnoitering the city to see where they can place the devices which are going to deliver these leaflets, which I said we've come to. So they're in this hotel, and uh, they um, chat to the receptionist and uh, some other woman who's working in the hotel, their age group nice attractive woman and they take them out and they in some nightclub uh having their drinks and these are women of relaxing. color i'm assuming sorry are these women of color are these black women that they're taking out okay i'm coming oh. to that oh not sorry to, not, okay, to, not to their eyes not to their eyes okay it's sorry for stepping on your you line know, Go cape, ahead. cape town cape town you won't find in those days a indigenous black African woman in the job as a receptionist. Okay. But it's a city still to this day with a huge mixed race population. And, uh, you know, the color there is like the States. It's from very light right through to darker shades. And these happen to be fairly light skinned women. <laughs> they're sitting in the club and they're chilling out, and suddenly there's a police raid. Um, the women jump up and they rush through to the toilet and uh, get out a back way and disappear. So they've lost their dates. 
The next wow. morning at the hotel, they asked them, what on earth happened? Why did you disappear? Why are you so frightened of the police? And they say, but don't you guys know? We shouldn't have been there. We're not white people. <laughs> We're colored people, <laughs> as mixed race people are called in South Africa. So, yeah, when I heard that story, I also cracked up. <laughs> um, but was so thankful that that you know didn't lead to any calamity. Um, it didn't happen with every group who were in the country, but quite a few uh, um, incidents of this nature did occur. One of the British guys, uh, at a time when one of the ways of distributing was breaking open your your um, false bottom in the case. And then posting, we'd give them a mailing list and they'd post letters to several hundred people. And he went into the post office. There's a, um, a queue for white people and then a separate queue for black people. And he stands in that queue and a policeman's walking by and actually roughs the man up oh, wow. and says, what on earth are you doing in this you get into your own queue over there and gives them a few blows. So, you know, the incidents of this nature do abound. But um, in the main, they got away with it. So, and, and so, well, let's move, because I, I actually, there's some other broader sort of conversations I want to get to you with. But but tell us first, and then I want to draw on the importance of the of making this film and getting it distributed. But you you have alluded to the sort of techniques that you use to get these materials into the country, how the letters were snuck in, how the pamphlets were stuck in. The goal is to basically let people know that the struggle is still happening, that there's the movement is still assembled and outside of South Africa, and that hope and resistance is still sort of on the move in some respects. So what how did you, how did you actually get things in the country and how did you actually execute distributing these things once they were in South Africa? Yes, right. You know, one one can't underestimate the impact of a leaflet about freedom in a police state yeah. or a slogan on a wall. Um, so initially, people were sent in uh, as I indicated, simply with leaflets in the mailing list, and they would post the leaflets. Then we evolved this to more activity. The next simple step was getting them to buy um, a length of calico, white material that you'd use for a banner, uh, paint a slogan on it, um, the ANC lives, mm. and instruct them how to roll that up um, and get on top of a skyscraper. Plenty of tall buildings around in South Africa, not like New York, I'm talking here about 10 stories or so. Uh, they are higher, but you don't want to go too high. Right. And how to then unfold this from that position so it screeches out the message from the streets. And we would, ex we, uh, we would train them up with some very simple uh, timing devices to delay the unfurling of the banner. We wanted them to, to be away from the spot. And one simple way is tying it up with string and then dabbing a bit of acid on the string. So it take five minutes, say, for the acid to eat through. And depending on the ballast in the banner, uh, it would unfurl, and by then the people were, were away down the street. Um, this kind of activity in about 1966, 67, and so on, um, managed to break through the silence of the press because it was quite sensational. We then went to bigger stage, and we thought of using something like a rocket taking a leaflet up into the air and uh, then disengaging so the load would flutter down. What we hit on ultimately, after a lot of experimentation on parks <laughs> in London, uh, you know, when there weren't people around and so on, um, we, we basically organized what we call the bucket bomb. And we showed them how to construct this. We'd give them a little bit of some elements of this, which in the end, when they were in their hotel room, they would stuff leaflets into this bucket. 
underneath the leaflets was just a little bit of a wooden guard so they wouldn't burn from underneath that putting using some black powder from a firework cracker and connecting that to a small timing device um, with a fuse the leaflets were filled in that bucket the bucket would be put into a shopping bag and we would tell them to to leave these at railway stations taxi ranks bus terminuses and the like and uh, to time it so that it would go off 10 minutes after they dispensed with the load at a point in time when workers were coming out of factories or catching mm. transport and we would get uh, We'd get these volunteers to work in pairs for safety. Without them knowing it, there would be others covering the major cities in South Africa. And at a particular time and day, all synchronized, something like, say, 30 of these devices would go off um, in, as I said, every main city. It was so sensational that this made headlines in all the South African newspapers. So that was the key way. Another very simple way was uh, getting them to purchase tape recorders, tape players. We would smoke, have them smuggle in with the leaflets, a small amplifier and a speech on tape and uh, instruct them to house us in a small box, find positions um, uh, from ledges of buildings or garages, multi-story garages, and again, a uh, simple time device, just switch it on before leaving. The first 10 minutes would be silent, and then a speech would um, blare out from the amplified box, and, and um, eyewitnesses w- w- reported in the press of sensational activity in the streets as as the workers um, voiced their support and the police rushed around to try and find the source of this and and smash it uh, but of course we we got them to put a sign on saying that there's a bomb here beware so that kept the police away for some significant time but it was this kind of activity i was referring to this creative activity yeah. of getting the information across it made a big big impact yeah that's a, that's amazing and so before we move off from the london recruits and i need to get your thoughts on contemporary south africa and and actually hopefully israel palestine as well there is this film london recruits which recounts these stories your role and many other people's roles in sort of putting this together and then um more of the stories that you talked about more of the tactics and strategies and it's really it's a project of kind of unbelievable internationalism i mean there's something so innately kind of stunning and inspiring about, you know, Danny Schechter or a young person from the Netherlands or the UK or wherever else, being willing to sort of go on that adventure and take tremendous personal risk to overturn yes. this obscene system. So talk about where this film is now and, and the importance of sort of seeing it through. It's in the making, uh, British company in Wales called Barefoot Rascals. Um, the listeners can, uh, can, can, can get the information on the website, London Recruits, and they'll find much there about the making of this film. Um, funds are being collected uh, through um, crowdfunding in Britain. We raised a lot of money to get the film started. Uh, there's a whole process of getting money and already contributions are coming in from the British trade union movement because many of the people concerned, men and women, were members and still are uh, of, of their trade unions. We are appealing to people in the United States and elsewhere to assist. Um, and the film is very important as you've indicated it's a story about tremendous courage it's a story about internationalism it reflects on 
uh, those heady times of the 60s and 70s where we recruited young people from the anti-Vietnam War struggles from the states right across the world, Britain and Europe, um, anti-apartheid movement. And, you know, it was a period filled with incredible spirit. Uh, people were prepared if uh, we had contact with them. Nobody really turned us down when we said, would you prepare to go the extra step? and go on a dangerous mission into South Africa and carry this message. They saw the internationalism in that. Uh, and, of course, we have that need today. Yeah. That's the message of the film. Uh, it tells a story which was not very well known, and these recruits didn't brag about what they did. In fact, they felt and still feel that they didn't do very much, that the struggle in South Africa uh, saw immense sacrifices by South Africa's own people. Um, and, you know, it's people like Tabo and Becky and others who have been interviewed who say that they filled an extremely important uh, role in that period where we couldn't really organize the message ourselves within the country. By 1975, things were different and our underground was developing and uh, the mass movement in South Africa was gaining headway. But that particular period had that distinctiveness we needed so badly the uh, support that I've referred to as we need in the in the world today I'm talking here about good positive things I'm talking about real international solidarity um, with oppressed with the um, exploited with people who are still struggling against racism against capitalism uh, countries which are very much under the heel of dictatorship. I'm not talking in any way about jihadism, this is irrational, um, and so on. We're talking here about internationalism where people know and understand uh, what the issues are about, what is required, uh, and very much it's the issue still of publicity, of information, of getting the solidarity messages across the internationalism which we've seen across the centuries and we saw so many times in the 20th century. So the message from the film, uh, we hope, revives the lessons of serving a good cause, serving um, the truth, serving to expose those who exploit and oppress uh, and bring inspiration for the kind of activities we've seen in the Occupy Wall Street movement, in the anti-war movements uh, ar around the world, in the protest against the absolute crying shame of 61 people in the world owning the wealth equivalent to the three and a half billion other half of the world, um, bringing people together in solidarity for real democracy, meaningful participatory democracy, for a move towards socialism, anti-war, and the emancipation of humanity. So, and it's really interesting in that the list and the motivation of this film, because that, that leads me to want to get your thoughts on the contemporary situation in South Africa, because you could have, frankly, quite rightly, at least in my view, after a lifetime of sort of political struggle and personal risk and then service in the first two democratic governments of South Africa, sort of, you know, uh, I guess watch the game. And relaxed, <laughs> but you're sort of still out there. And you wrote, you wrote a piece. I believe it was in two thir in 2013. It was called "How the ANC's Fastian uh, Pact Sold Out South Africa's Poorest." And you sort of, and, and there's a transition here. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you sort of criticized the ANC's kind of acceptance of kind of global neoliberalism. 
uh, under the presidencies of Mandela and Mbeki, which you uh, served in. That's one aspect of it, but you still seem to uh, have, obviously, from Mandela, a great deal, I mean, enormous respect. For Mbeki, a lot of respect. And in many respects, it might be interesting to get your thoughts on Mbeki because I think Mbeki, you know, there's a very fixed view of him in, in the West, in the United States. Uh, but under Zuma, you have gotten to a point where this sort of critique of neoliberalism has, critique, has sort of fused with your concerns about corruption in South Africa, corruption in the ANC, to the point where you have left the party and you're sort of working on a new iteration of politics in South Africa, which is grassroots driven, which actually maybe harkens back in many ways to the work that you and so many others did in the ANC. So maybe if you could just sort of lead us through starting with this critique of the ANC and neoliberalism and, and where we are today. Well, um, one has to start with the incredible achievement of toppling apartheid yes. through our mass struggle led by the ANC. Uh, and the wisdom, uh, you know, it's not just Mandela. There was a collective leadership of luminaries, Governor Mbeki, Walter Sisulu, um, and so many others who were imprisoned with him and many who died. Uh, some uh, executed, like Vuyasili Mini, the trade unionist and others, killed in detention. So a huge sacrifice. The world never thought that we would be able to remove apartheid. In the end, there was the negotiated settlement, and uh, mainly because, in the main, uh, the ruling class in South Africa and its political uh, elite, the National Party, from Boerta to de Klerk, saw that, uh, they saw the writing on the wall, that there would be a bloody revolution if they didn't reform. Uh, and they wanted a reform in terms of keeping property and the economic control intact. Um, at that particular point in time, 1990, and our first elections, 94, there's huge uh, bloodshed in the country. Many more thousands died in that period than in the period pre to the lifting of the ban on the ANC and other liberation movements in the country. Uh, so you, you, one has to understand yeah. that particular context. It's, it's not easy. Uh, in the process, though, I feel, in retrospect, and there's nothing like 2020 vision, sure. um, but I feel that we actually could have got a much better deal, given that uh, the masses were in the ascendancy, we had strong United Trade Union movement, um, and we had the support from the whole world. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, in the concessions which were made at the negotiating table, and there is give and take when you're having to get through a situation where you, you haven't beaten them on the battlefield, uh, but of course they're fearing the way things can go. Uh, in, in that particular situation, when we examine the compromises, we, we gave too much on the economic front. And again, when you've got the captains of industry and the leaders of the capitalist world saying to Mandela and leadership that if you guys go through with your um, radical nationalization, land redistribution, uh, you're going to be isolated. You're not going to receive any investments from abroad. You know, your, your country is going to be stunted. And, you know, it, it's up to you. And you're looking at the poverty in the country and you're looking at the violence from the right wing and you feel that the way ahead is through taking what's on offer because you know you will win the election hands down as the ANC did, well over 60% of the vote. You take the political levers of power and along with Mandela and his able lieutenant and Becky, very bright people, and a collective, and I was part of it, you feel that let's have our hands on the levers of power and we will then erode the economic order and get to the point where we can control it. We did that, and that's what I call the Faustian Pact, and not just pointing finger at Mandela or Mbeki, who right, are our two right. most 
leading people. I, I was in the Communist Party as well as the ANC, Joe Slovo. You know, we all agreed to that. Um, a little bit of misgiving. Some of us said, you know, we could step up the struggle some more. Let, let me give an example in looking back where I say I think the balance of forces were more in our favor. That threat from the West or business and investment that we would be isolated and so on, um, would the African-Americans stood by in your country and allowed their government to put the squeeze on South Africa? Would the anti apartheid movement straightening the world have been silent in the face of those kind of attempts by you know, what led is the Washington Consensus right. and the EU. We would have, we had that very important detachment on our side and the strength of our own people. So we missed that particular opportunity. And, you know, when I say a Faustian pact, uh, we accepted the political power in exchange for putting off the economic to another day. But what we do know, and we knew this before then, which is where I kick myself in the, uh, the, the pants, is that those who dominate society economically, even if they don't have the control of most political parties, they are able to call the tune. They erode your power. And this is the straitjacket we're in. Of course, the Soviet Union had collapsed, not that we wanted a Soviet-style rule, we wanted democracy, but at least when pre the Soviet, when the Soviet Union existed, there was this, this knowledge that we could rely on East European countries, China, socialism, to give us a balance against the West. But that, that all broke down, which, which made it all the more um, likely to go along with the scenario which, which I explain and call that Faustian pact. Um, the trouble is when you had, and I come to your question about Tabo Becky, the most brilliant mind amongst us, a man who had um, Marxist understanding, uh, very deep that is, who had a tremendous strategic overview of the world, and um, who was really with Mandela and after striving to walk this tightrope to help us get into a situation where we would become masters of our own destiny in terms of building our e economic power. Um, okay, you, one might say, well, that was going to be impossible even for Mbeki. I, I'm just making a point that with someone of the sophistication, and I'm not talking in elitist terms, of an Mbeki, um, we had perhaps a chance. But at the same time, in that Faustian pact, you have building up forces, which I would say are on the, the right wing of the ANC, uh, narrow nationalist groupings, people who are ready to to make the most of crony capitalism, which mm -hmm. of course is something very difficult to oppose, to defend, to prevent, if you aren't very, very rigorous. And that opening occurs, I'm not against the emergence of black capitalists in our country, but you need that occurring when you have very strong leadership. But when you have a leadership, and I'm talking about a leadership that succeeds Mbeki after This is Austin, the current leadership of Jacob Zuma. Where you get crony capitalism uh, running unchecked, then you lead under the present administration and a president who, unlike Mbeki, was clearly facing very serious corruption charges. Um, and is still doing everything possible to keep himself out of court. And this is where uh, he had tremendous support from that faction, which has now grown and dominated in the ANC in our movement, um, who want to make, make wealth for themselves in the first place. And this is where, instead of serving the people, 
you become and you find yourselves in a situation of serving oneself. So that at present in South Africa is the way the pendulum has moved and one still hopes to see that uh, within the ANC and our liberation movement that positive forces and there is a struggle taking place will come to the fore. But I happen to feel that uh, it's good and I support those comrades within who are struggling but I feel that we need a voice, an organized voice to the left of the ANC now uh, because we're not just talking about uh, the struggle against racial oppression, it's absolutely intertwixed with capitalism and capitalist exploitation and we need a very clear-cut voice to the left of the ANC which raises the question of socialism. In the past that voice and organization was the Communist Party of South Africa which I've left to join with a nascent emerging left socialist opposition out of trade unions, particularly the Metal Workers Union, NUMSA, uh, a united front which is uh, emerging, uh, and civil society. Uh, it's going to be a tough battle. I'm not, um, uh, I'm, I'm not over-optimistic about it. I think it will take time. But I think it will also speak to people within the ANC and the liberation movement as such. Uh, to to get them doing similar work from within, but we're doing this work from without as pressure on our government and, and on our ruling party, the ANC. Well, uh, one more final question. We only have a, a couple minutes left, and it's okay. all fascinating. But I really I know that you like to get uh, the opportunity to also speak out. You are, uh, you know, a part of your identity is you're Jewish, Jewish revolutionary, Jewish socialist. You've, as part of that, spoken out a lot in on the issue of Israel-Palestine. And I want to give you the opportunity in the final couple of minutes we have to share your perspective on that. Well, you see, for South Africans, it's not difficult to see the racist colonial... Uh, character of Israel, the supplanting of the indigenous Palestinian people uh, by Zionism, which is a, a, a narrow, um, inclusivist nationalism, using uh, the Bible to justify the claims that the land belongs to uh, the Jewish people and to none other. I mean, this is absolutely unjust. It's ahistorical. And the methods they use remind all of us South African freedom fighters, bar none, who have visited not just the occupied territories, Gaza, the West Bank, but Israel itself, to see the discrimination against Palestinians, against the Bedouin, against people of color within Israel, whatever they claim about their democracy, these are second-class citizens. But, of course, the appalling military occupation, uh, the absolute horrendous siege of Gaza, the constant uh, killings of Palestinian people. And uh, as someone who's of Jewish descent, uh, when they claim that they're doing this for the Jewish people, I say not in my name, along with a growing number of, of, of Jewish people in the United States and South Africa, uh, Europe and elsewhere. Um, uh, Mandela said we cannot be free until the Palestinian people are free. And I, I take that to heart. So, look, we've, we've, I've made the point about that. Please let me end by again appealing to your good listeners to give support to this great internationalist um, film that we're making, London Recruits, and to check our website, which is just London Recruits. They'll get enormous information about how they can help make this film and spread the word. Thanks very much it's, indeed. It's linked on our website. And, and Ronnie Cosrolls, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it immensely. A pleasure. Thank you.
Last night, <coughs> watching the television, and they play a clip of Sarah Palin endorsing Donald Trump. And my wife is like, oh, oh, my God, I can't watch this. This is insane. And I'm like, dude, this is the good stuff. The bad stuff is what all of their supporters and the other people do when they're not going up and acting like two cartoon characters. This at least we can enjoy. It's far worse with the smart ones. <laughs> I do. I always like the sort of romantic way in which you speak to your wife in these stories. Oh, yeah. Dude, talking about. What, what's wrong with you? You get it, brah. <laughs> Funnel. The point is we do keg stands. We watch Palin endorse Trump. That's what's supposed to be dude, fun, dude. Dude, dude. Just pack the bomb. Just pack the bomb. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. But seriously, Let's get to pack this. the bonk. <laughs> Let's get to this. Let me start by saying that the feigned astonishment, the outrage, the idea that Donald Trump represents something bizarre in the Republican Party, as evidenced by the fact that Sarah Palin endorsed him last night, it should go without saying. But let's just remind you of one thing. The reason why Sarah Palin is now not an ex-governor of Alaska who finished her term and is now maybe doing some lobbying for the oil companies in Anchorage is because of John McCain, the moderate maverick of the Republican Party. The reason why Ted Cruz is running second to Donald Trump is because he was endorsed by Sarah Palin in his Senate race. And that's, at least according to Ted Cruz a couple years ago, the only reason why he won. So this notion that somehow, <laughs> Sarah Palin coming up there acting like a lunatic, go back and listen to every time she spoke. She hasn't gotten any stupider. She hasn't gotten any crazier. She hasn't gotten any less legitimate. She is John McCain's creation. And here she is talking about right wing and bitter cling and pile cling and poopa poopa poopa. I have no idea what she's saying here. Go ahead, Sarah Palin. Oh, and tell somebody like um, Phyllis Schlafly. She is the Republican conservative movement icon and hero and a Trump supporter. Tell her she's not conservative. Uh, how about the rest of us? Right wing and bitter clinging, proud clingers of our guns, our God, our in our religions, in our constitution. Tell us that we're not red enough. Yeah, coming from the establishment, right? There you go. And uh, of course, yeah. And of course, she's she's referencing. It's all this Obama hate, right? I mean, it's all from when Obama said they're clinging to their guns and their religion and uh, whatever it is. And um, if you ever want to know the problem with the white race, I mean, I don't know what more I could say. But but we must this woman. we must repeat isolate that right wing and bitter clinging again and repeat it. We we have to. Right wing and bitter clinging proud clingers. Again. Right wing and bitter clinging proud clingers. Again. Right wing and bitter clinging proud clingers. Jimmy Reaper be used you like, better, better be getting a song out. That's going to be used at Guantanamo if they reinstitute torture there under a Republican president. No question. Right wing and bitter cling and proud clinger. Do you remember that, that, that tape where you had that guy, I can't remember, Knopf, I think it is, running for, uh, for mayor in Cleveland some guy in the background is going like, boo, boo, Ben Knopp, boo, boo, Cedar, boo, boo Cedar. That'll boo be my new co-hosting technique. Boo. boo, Cedar, Cedar lies. Well, here is a moment where Ted Cruz um, is facing off with a Donald Trump fan who is surrounded by other Donald Trump fans. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to think about here that are really fascinating. One, it's just funny to see someone as odious as Ted Cruz meet up with someone who I also probably 
if I had to spend some time with them, <clears throat> would find would be odious too. But to see these two odious people square off at each other, that's always enjoyable. Also, contemplate this moment where a Donald Trump fan does a similar thing. If you are one of those people who are afraid that Hillary Clinton might lose in a general election, if a Donald Trump fan did something like this to a Hillary Clinton, if it would come off in a different way, that would hurt rather than uh, would hurt the, uh, the the Donald Trump fan or at least Donald Trump's campaign as opposed to the candidate. And then lastly, just to sort of counteract that, listen to what this guy uh, complains about Ted Cruz at the end. It's an incredibly substantive um, complaint, which um, I tend to agree with. All right, here it is. Anyone that wants to be president owes it to the people of this state to come in front of you and ask for your support. And I'm running to be everyone's president. Those who vote for me, even those we who don't, don't want vote you. For me. Well, you're, you're entitled to your view, sir, and I will respect it. In fact, I will do the protect, math. I will. You know, you ask cases right. to drop out. It's your turn. Well, take okay. your own words. Now I'm curious, sir. Time to drop out. When sir. Donald doesn't get to 1237, are you going to call Donald's him to drop out? Donald's definitely going to get to 1237. No, he's, no, he's, he's going to get more than 1237. Let me ask you something, sir. What What do you like about Donald? Everything. Do you, give me one. <laughs> Everything. Give me one. Can you pick anything? Donald Trump will fuck too. The wall. <laughs> okay, the wall. That's the main thing. All Immigration. Right. building the wall. All right, hold, hold on a second. Now, do you know on the wall that Donald told the New York Times editorial board he's not going to build a wall? He's not going to deport anyone? You're lying. Once well, again, lying Ted! Well, sir, you know, actually, <laughs> civilized people don't just scream and yell at each other. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not. I'm not yelling at everybody. Do you know that Donald's words were caught on tape? The New York Times reported the whole thing, publicly reported. Uh, that's a total lie made up. Oh, lie. Okay, lying Ted. No, let, no let, let me ask. Queer politicians have killed America. Let, let me ask you are the problem. Let me ask you. You are the problem, right, politician. You, you are the problem. Can I ask you something? No. Can I ask you no. something? No. You Out of the all of the candidates, name one who had a million dollar judgment against him for hiring illegal aid. Name one. Donald is Trump is the only. Uh, That's right. Okay, Not so, you. so you like you. rich people where's who your buy politics. Where's your Goldman Sachs jacket at? We know your wife works there. <laughs> Where's your Goldman Sachs jacket? Uh, so that is this guy um, attacking um, uh, Ted Cruz mercilessly. And, and I have to say that, look, imagine Ted Cruz looking as helpless and hapless as you can. That's what he looks like in this. Well, but can I just add, I mean... Just in terms of boo, having a Seattle, Michael Brooks, boo, boo, <laughs> boo, boo, boo. No, but Ted Cruz is the literally the last person in politics. Like the notion that he thought, I'm going to go over there and use the old Ted Cruz likability and personal persuasion skills. Well, that's the problem that Ted like, Cruz has in this situation. Is delusional. that here you have a guy who's being really rude, but funny, right to his face. And what's amazing because, you know, if you look at that Ben Knopp, uh, uh, that famous Ben Knopp thing where he's running for mayor, you, you know, it's funny. I laughed and I watched that a thousand times and I laugh hard. Uh, and my, my daughter watched it. But you she sort laughed. of feel for but him you a sort little. of feel bad for the guy because the guy has a certain likability. And, you know, even if you don't, I had no idea what the guy's politics were, but you just you sort of feel bad for him on a human level. What's astonishing about this uh, I exchange is that I don't know if you could find anybody in the country i don't think you could find anybody outside the country i, I mean like i don't I like i don't like you could you could find someone i don't know from the furthest regions of the globe and just put them down and you know how they always do these things like where human beings respond to other human beings regardless of the context like you could turn the volume down and this and that i don't think anybody would feel an ounce of, <laughs> of empathy for ted cruz in this situation which is beautiful so that uh, um, last uh, clip we played was this guy, a, a Trump supporter, going head to head with Ted Cruz, really um, showing that like, he doesn't care what Ted Cruz has to say. He's just going to get into his face and uh, make uh, Ted Cruz feel like he's nothing. Well, here this guy has the exchange. It continues on just as funny. But at the end of it, the Trump supporter has actually a critique that I think is um, pretty well founded. And look. Like I say, this exchange happens with Hillary Clinton. 
people are going to feel a little more sympathetic for Hillary Clinton. However, if this Trump supporter is genuinely voting on um, the issue he brings up at the end here, uh, you know, that I think is going to be um, uh, uh, tricky for Hillary Clinton on some level, at least within the context of this exchange. You sir, just, just go home and Google Donald punch in the face protesters. And at his rallies, look, this is on national television. You can watch the facts of him standing at the podium saying, punch that guy in the face. I mean, that's, and in fact, he says, he'll pay, I'll pay your legal fees when you punch him in the face. And, and there's a problem. Listen, Donald Trump has accused everyone in this race of being a liar. Donald cannot tell the truth in one minute. You'll find out tomorrow. So, Indiana don't want you. Well, sir, you are entitled to no, have your rights, but I'll tell you this. Yeah. I will yeah. 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 Sir, America is a better country. Without you. Thank you for those kind sentiments. Let me point out, I have treated you respectfully the entire time. And a question that everyone here should ask. Are you Canadian? Do you want your kids, are you Canadian? Do you want your kids repeating the words of Donald Trump? Would you be proud if your kids came home oh! and yelling and insulting? And let me give Pause you an example. It. I think it's pretty clear that these guys would be pretty, pretty proud of their kids if they were repeating the words of Donald Trump. I mean, this guy is going. And I got to say, he's pretty good. You know what the question everyone wants to monitor? You're Canadian. <laughs> Good. Of Donald's problems with the truth. <clears throat> Yesterday, he was on national television. He was asked about his support from Mike Tyson, a convicted rapist. And his response is, Ted says Tyson's a rapist. That's why we call him Lion Ted. Mike Tyson was convicted of by a jury of his peers, served three years in prison for rape here in the state of Indiana, and yet Donald screams, it's a lie to say Mike Tyson is a racist. Sir, facts matter. Truth matters. But you want to carpet bomb women and children, huh? Now, that's actually interesting. You say carpet bomb women and children. Those are your words. No, no actu bomb. actually. I added the women and children because that's what you're going to be doing when sir, you carpet bomb sir, sir, sir. Wow. That's good. I mean, where did that come from? Yeah, that's incredible. Hey, man, go back to Canada. Blah, blah. Uh, incidentally, I think your foreign policy is overly aggressive, and uh, the definition of carpet bomb means you're going to be killing women and children when you say that. And I love the Ted Cruz's response. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Lion Ted, I also have some serious humanitarian reservations about you throwing the phrase carpet bomb in around. You Why do you like, like Donald Trump strange, so much? You look like a strange looking penis. Also, I don't appreciate the the aggressive stance that you want to take in various parts of the world and well, what it's like going to mean for human issues. Build that goddamn issues. wall. <laughs> I also think that your tendency towards dehumanizing the Syrians is really does not bode well for either international law or the standing of the United States in an increasingly connected global order. It is just Lion Ted. <laughs> getting to be so strange. That's only about half of that video, too, if people want to I look know. Up the rest of it. I really feel like maybe tomorrow we play the rest of it. All right, now let's get to this other story of uh, of <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, in a 1991 recording, this has uh, been obtained by the uh, Washington Post, uh, Mark Fisher. A man who claims to be a spokesman for Donald Trump named John M Miller tells a People magazine reporter about Trump's first divorce his romance with France's first future with France's future, future first lady at the time and his messy breakup with Marla Maples. Here is just the first minute of this John Miller talking uh, to this People magazine reporter. Now, just I just want to set this up for a moment. Just imagine, and it, this goes on for 15, 20 minutes or so, and this John Miller is just... Man, I'll tell you something. If, I mean, thank God it was a spokesperson talking this way because if Donald Trump had talked about this way about himself, it would look so pathetic. Uh, but when you have a spokesperson talking about you this way, who really is explaining, I, I mean, this couldn't, I mean, John Miller is obviously 
a totally different person than Donald Trump. Otherwise, they'd have the same name. <laughs> Let's listen to this. What's your name again? John Miller. Did you work with John Miller? Yes, that's correct. John Miller. Can you sort of, uh, I guess we're going to try and put a story together. We have a deadline of today because our magazine closed well, basically yesterday, but we'll probably get something together about the things that's been on the cover of both New York Post and yeah, the day. Yeah, I saw that. What kind of comment is, is coming from either your agency or from, from Donald? Uh, well, it's just that uh, he really decided that he wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't want to make the commitment. He didn't want to make a commitment. He really thought it was too soon. Uh, he's coming out of a, uh, you know, marriage that, uh, and, he's, and he's starting to do tremendously well financially. As you saw, he got his license just five to nothing the other day. <laughs> tremendously and, well. You know, totally unanimous. And, and he's really been working hard and doing well. And, and probably, as you know, there's a real estate depression in the United States, and he's probably doing as well as anybody there is and, and frankly he wants to keep it that way frankly yeah no that's not there's no reason to believe a lot of people say tremendously well and frankly and that's yeah no he's you know but here's the thing this guy john miller such a great spokesman uh because it's not just i mean he's really speaking from the heart he's very complimentary of donald trump i mean let's listen to this cl uh, clip number two because um you know, John Miller's really sticking up for uh, for Donald Trump here about, you know, the way he is with ladies, too. I, this guy is a great spokesperson. What's the John Miller? He treats everybody well. And, yeah. You know, you don't know him, but he's a... No, I have met him. Have you met him? Yeah. He's, he's a good guy, and he's not going to hurt anybody. Uh, the one article said he's going to throw around the apartment is total nonsense. Um, he's, uh, he's uh, you know, going to always treat her well as he treated his, his wife well. I mean, he paid his wife a great deal of money. In a, in a very bad period of time, and ultimately that was settled. There were those that say that that was, that was even put that way. I don't know if you've heard that, but that Trump became poor so, until he got his divorce, and then all of a sudden he's been doing very well. And I guess you probably heard that too. And, but he, he treated his wife well, and he treated, uh, and he will treat Mama well. And, you know, he's, he's somebody that has a lot of options, and frankly, uh, you know, he gets called by everybody. He gets called by everybody in the book in terms of women. And, uh, I know. Well, he gets called by a lot of people. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, what about, I mean, this Carla Brady, how important is she right now? Is she not well, I think, I think it's, I think it's somebody that, you know, she's uh, beautiful. I, I saw her once quickly and she's beautiful and all, but, uh, I think that, uh, <laughs> she's got an all open field, really. And, and, uh, you know, a lot of the people that you write about, and you people do a great job, by the way, but a lot of the people that you write about really are, um, I mean, they, they call. They just call actresses, people that you write about, just call to see if they can go out with them and things. So. That is, boy, oh boy, that John Miller is just effusive, and he's almost. John Miller seems so desperate to prove that uh, Donald Trump actually is is desired by women. Uh, it's just, God, that level of commitment by John Miller. I, I was curious how he knew how good looking she was, but I guess he only saw her, he saw her one time very briefly. And yeah, he saw her one, one time. Yeah, it'd be really hard to know what she looked like considering she was an international model. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he saw her one time briefly and, um, you know, he, uh, but John Miller did. Yeah, John Miller. As look, I mean... As uh, I would imagine, if you are a guy like Donald Trump, you bring your spokesperson around to see women to check out, like, yeah, yay or nay on this. That's just one of the things that a spokesperson, a good spokesperson, do.